back with Living the Run. Those of you just tuning in on this June 6th, National Running Day. National Running Day. I did get a run in today. It was uh, it was treacherous. I had a 100-meter. Uh, somebody told me that they thought this would be a good workout. And uh, I'm going to have to believe, say, And you believe them. <laughs> this was a, get this, 100-meter dash followed by 10 pull-ups, followed by 100-meter dash, followed by 10 burpees. How fast, how fast was a 100-meter no, dash? No rest. 30 seconds rest after those four. And you do 10 rounds of it. How, how uh, fast was a 100-meter dash? Well, how fast was my 100-meter dash? Well, well, I mean, what percentage of, of effort were you? I mean, were you, you, were you all out sprinting? No, especially not at the beginning, but to eight. 80 to 90 percent. 80 to 90 percent. So, so I'm sorry. I got to add this up again. 100 meter dash at almost, we'll say 90 percent. Yep. 10 pull ups. 10 pull ups. 100 meter dash back. 10 burpees. 10 burpees. 30 second rest. 30 second rest. 10 rounds. So really, you're going, you're going. You know, normally the one to one ratio is for aerobic, and then it's like a, I think it's like a two to five ratio or something like that for anaerobic. But uh, you, you went, so you were probably working out for what, four minutes straight? Yeah. About, and you took 30 seconds rest. Yeah. Then you three, about again. three minutes, three minutes, and then 30 seconds rest. It got rough. Oh, yeah. I, I can imagine. <laughs> when did the lactic acid kick in? About set three? <laughs> set three or four. Yeah, set three set or three four. Or four. It, it's good. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're going to be rocked, yeah, man. Yeah, I, I wanted to put that in for National Running Day, though. It was a good one. Hey, before we go, I want to hear Chris Randolph at the break said he wanted to chip in with his favorite Paul Tarek story. Oh, well, yeah. He said none I of think, them were radio appropriate. Yeah, I think, uh, what I said was that uh, I have probably maybe six or seven stories, but they just really aren't uh, radio appropriate. <laughs> They're not appropriate, family friendly. So. Yeah. None of them appropriate. Let's, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, if you made it through that workout without throwing up, then you did better than Paul Tarek. So, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, to be to be Paul. truthful, I've never, I have not thrown up in a running, in a, in a, have in you a really? running yeah. workout. I've come close. I've, I've had the dry heaves a few times. <laughs> Thank goodness I didn't eat before I went maybe, to practice. Maybe that's what I saw was the Paul dry heaves. Still, still enough daylight to try that workout. Still not, enough. No, I'm not going to do it. No still way. enough daylight for all you Living the Run listeners to get a run in here. Let's get quickly tips and takeaways from today. Uh, I would say my tip and takeaway is from Harry, how he talked about the decathlon and, and Randolph, too. They talked about being able to do something, whether it's good or bad. You, you move on to the next event. You know, it, you, you can you can transfer that skill directly to life. Good things are going to happen and bad things are going to happen. Uh, you need to be able to move on, you know, plug through it, uh, get on to the next thing and approach that. If you carry the... Uh, stresses and angers of, of one part of your day, you know, it could ruin the rest of your day. You need to learn to forget those things and move on. Rando, give us one. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Tarek on that. And also that, uh, you know, you're you're going to practice uh, like you're going to compete in the competition. I mean, for me, that's a big one, is, is going out every day and making sure that I'm doing exactly what I want to do in the competition uh, that's coming up in a couple weeks at the trials. And so it's a great outlook. And, you, I mean, it's a you're going to win if you do it. Absolutely. I, the one I'll take away, and we said this the other day, is John Wooden said, make each day your masterpiece. And it almost kind of sounded like when you get out and you participate in any event, make it your best for that day. And, and just give it the best on that day and, and – and and know that uh, that's the best opportunity you had and that's what you have to do coming up here in two weeks going into this decathlon uh, you've got uh, ten events you know you don't get two down by one event you go forward those of you let's let's look up Chris Randolph he's a, an Olympic hopeful local guy fun guy awesome awesome stuff awesome potential thank you Chris for joining us thank you to Harry Mara for joining us in studio next weekend or next week on Living the Run Sharon Day Olympian in 2008 live healthy live bold live Live the run. Talking to Chris Randolph, Olympic hopeful in the decathlon. Olympic trials here in two weeks up in Eugene, Oregon. You know, I don't know if we heard earlier, but on Dan Patrick's show, we had uh, uh, Oregon golf coach um, Casey Martin was on there. But I think it was because Dan Patrick couldn't get the coach that we've got, Oregon Track Club elite coach Harry Mara, former coach of Paul Tarek. Harry, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I, I know Dan Patrick was trying to, to get you, but uh, the phone was busy there, and so uh, we got you. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> maybe after the Olympics, Coach. Coach. Uh, maybe. <laughs> we'll Co see. Coach, start us off. Tell us how much do you miss coaching Paul Tarek? Oh, I miss him every single day. <laughs> 
<laughs> good, and, good and bad days, right? Yeah, well, you know what? They were all good days. We had a great, a great, a great time together. Uh, Paul did some outstanding things athletically. He also pitched some hurdles pretty far over the fence uh, every once in a while. But uh, all in all, it was a great, it was a great ride. <laughs> I mean, Coach, you got to admit, the, the first day we met, you know, I, I could maybe get the hurdle over the fence from the track. By the, time I, by the time I retired, my hurdle technique over the fence throwing that thing was, I was clearing it by 10, 15, 20 feet. Yeah, and then your shot put got better, too, because of that. Yeah, see, that's, <laughs> see it all, it all, it all uh, you know, affected everything else. It was a good good training event. Coach, talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the, the history of the decathlon. I know you've been around it uh, as much as anybody. Runner's Magazine that just had you profiled in there with... Uh, Ashton Eaton talked about you as the dean of the American Decathlon. Uh, shoot, we had uh, great runs initially with the Decathlon, then it kind of seemed to go away. Maybe 1976 to 90 seemed to, to lose that edge as Americans, and now that edge has kind of come back, starting with Dan O'Brien and moving forward where we've had medals in every Olympics since. Uh, talk about the history, history of it, uh, what it's meant to you, what you've seen among these athletes uh, over time and where you see the Decathlon today. Well, starting right from today, it's, a, it's at a good spot uh, in, in some in many ways. I mean, you have Brian Clay, who's defending Olympic champion. You have uh, Trey Hardy, who's two-time world champion. And now a young guy, Ashton Eaton, who is world indoor champion and heptathlon world record holder. So that's good. There's three guys right at the top. And then uh, Miller Moss, Jake Arnold, and a number of others along the way coming up. Uh, depth is important in the decathlon. Uh, you have to have numbers because, as Paul can well tell you, uh, it's an injury looking for a place to happen. So, heaven forbid, knock on wood, that these top three guys don't get hurt and and do make the team going through the very intense trials. And, uh, you know, a guy like Chris Randolph could rise up on, on any one occasion and be right there, be right there on that team, which would be great. What's it? Uh, uh, Go ahead, Coach. But uh, uh, historically speaking, America has done very well under the gaff on over the years at the Olympic Games. I can remember not, you know, personally, but historically remembering uh, reading about Bob Mathias as a young kid in London, uh, 1948, winning it as a high school kid. And then I think they swept it in 52 in Helsinki. And that's kind of what the ESPN and Runner's World and those people are talking about right now. Uh, there's a possibility of that. And if, if Clay Hardy and Eaton were ready and made the team, could they sweep it? It's possible, but the deal is this. I think people have to realize this. More can go wrong during the course of the decathlon than, than can go right. So you have to deal with that chaos. And the people that deal with it usually are successful. So it, it'll be a struggle. It'll be tough. It'll be tough to do that. What do you think with the, with regards to the advertising? It's interesting you say more can go wrong uh, in the decathlon than can go right. We're talking to, to Coach Harry Mara on ESPN Radio here, 1280, Living the Run. Uh, you know, are you talking what happened when they made that huge campaign back in the 90s on Dave Johnson, Dan O'Brien, and then Dave Johnson doesn't even make the team? Uh, Dan, Dan, Dan didn't make the oh, team. Oh, sorry. Dan, was, Dan O'Brien didn't make the Dan team? Didn't make oh, the Dan team. didn't make Dave the team. Did, Dan didn't. Dave makes it. And, and, you know, now you have this huge campaign and now we, we lose one of the guys. Uh, do you think that there will be a big campaign for these three potential, or you think it's going to still lay low and uh, more Americans are going to miss out on seeing the world's greatest athletes. I mean, we got Chris Randolph in here in studio, Paul Tarek. You look at these guys and you watch what they can do. There's just nobody athletically that can do more than these guys can do, yet people aren't tuning into it. Are we going to be able to get some some advertising to get people to start to tune in? To just I think uh, it's, a, it's a very good question you ask, and I think the answer is this. Uh, I can't tell the future. Will we get more information on it and more uh, bits out there and, and hits out there so the world and the United States becomes aware of what 
people like Randolph Carrick, uh, Hardy Eaton, and all those guys, Clay, can do? I'm not sure. The problem lies with the sport of track and field, and therein lies the problem. It is, pick up the page right now, pick up the same, well, maybe not San Luis Obispo paper, but pick up an average paper, you won't see anything on track and field in there. Are, uh, are we above average coach or below average in that paper? No, I think, I, I would say, I haven't been there now in a few years, but I would say you're probably a little bit above average. I mean, even having a show like this down in San Luis, uh, I don't know a lot of cities that have this kind of thing, and I think it's great. But we need more media hits out there. A young kid eating his cereal in the morning needs to flip through the sports page and see something on track and field. I'm 64. When I was a kid, I, I, I could find that. Now you find football, basketball, baseball, and, oh, if you find something on track, it's Joe Schmo that popped for drugs or something like that. It's negative stuff. So we, the sport needs to grow. We need a visionary in there that will take the sport to the next level, and then all of track and field will get hyped, and therefore the decathlon and high jump and whatever else will get hyped too. That, that's my take on it. Well, I think the, the one thing to, to remember, Coach, about that, uh, you know, the, the debacle with Reebok back then, it wasn't a failure of track and field. It wasn't a failure of the athletes. Yes, Dan didn't make the team, but that's the thing is that's part of the event. The, the failure was... Was, was I think in the and I don't want to say the ad campaign was a failure because that, that was a, that was a lucrative campaign for Reebok. They made a lot of money on that campaign. Uh, right. But the failure was they promised something that wasn't guaranteed to the people. They, they started months in advance promising this matchup that was never guaranteed from the start. You know, all they all they would have had to done was to you know focus on the trials and say these two guys are going to the Olympics. Could one of them be this? And promote it towards the trials. And then if that happens at the trials, then Dave you know now Dave is their show horse and he moves on to the Olympics and then they can reshift their focus. That was the only failure, but unfortunately, it left a black eye on the whole sport because, like you said, you know, people they don't know anything about the sport. They don't know they have the attention span that lasts a hundredth of a second shorter than the world record in the hundred meters. And if it, if it's not if it's not broken, then they're already onto something else. And it's like, oh well, the, the decathlon failed. And they're they're terrible athletes, and they can't do this. Okay, moving on. Hey, what's next? Uh, well, that's a classic uh, Paul Derrick statement right there about the attention span. It is great. It, you know what? You know what's funny? It, it, it's like a game of chess. It really is. Is. And you know what? The uh, not to, not to insult the entire American public, uh, but they how many people play chess seriously? You, you don't. You know, you, it's not a thing that you learn growing up. You might learn it, but over in other countries, here you've been to them with me. They they all know how to play chess. Like everybody right. knows how to play right. these thinking man's games. You know, and they all you know strategy involved. We play checkers here. Well, here's a here's a real good example. I mean, we know we we're talking about the example where Dan, unfortunately, uh, no hide it in the pole vault down in uh, New Orleans in the trials in 92. Last year in Eugene, uh, Brian Clay unfortunately got hurt, so he had to pull out of the meet after the hurdles. And Ashton Eaton was having a very good meet. I happened to coach Ashton Eaton. But he was having a very good meet. And then his hurdles went well, and his discus went well, and he was warming up in the pole vault, did his warm-up look good, and he hadn't entered the competition yet. So I'm sitting here waiting for the bar to get, I think he came in at 15 feet or 14.9 or something, and I was sitting there and the bar was at a lower height and some lady said, Coach, Ashton's having a very, very good meet. You look really uptight and really nervous. I turned around and said, you damn right I am. I said, he hasn't vaulted yet and you don't know what could happen. I mean, uh, hopefully he's going to get over the bar and he did. It wasn't a problem but things like that, that's one of the issues with the decaf while I was thinking about earlier. Anything can happen. You can be on and then all of a sudden you just lost the feel for that event and um, uh, you know how Jenner did it in 75 just before the national at the national championship uh, and, and lost that beat. so anything can happen Coach I don't know if you remember we're talking to Coach Harry Mara he's the coach of uh, Ashton Eaton World record holder in the indoor, uh, what is that? The indoor heptathlon, heptathlon man. right? Heptathlon. Indoor heptathlon, heptathlon of course. You got to, Randall. You got to educate. Uh, <laughs> you got to educate Rex over there. Here on ESPN 1280, living the run, and we got Chris Randolph, Olympic hopeful, as well in studio. I remember, Coach 2008. Uh, Brian Clay was one high jump away from uh, getting a goose egg in the high jump as well. He missed his first two heights there, and I remember the the crowd uh, all of a sudden had a gasp uh, watching him on a third entry height, uh, talking exactly what you've said, is, is uh, more can go wrong, seemingly, in these events than it can go right. I, I take that to this. When you've got Ashton Eaton, who has already set
set a world record this year going into the Olympic trials? Uh, is it make the team or is it, uh, you know, best score? Go, go for the best score and, and put things together. Uh, do you play these things safe? What, what's the advice that a coach gives in these types of events uh, going forward? Well, we have th- uh, a three-pronged attack uh, approach here, I guess you would say. Number one, obviously, the general conception is make the team. That's the bottom line. How do you do that? The second prong of attack is let's do in the competition, on those two days of the trial, exactly what we've been doing in practice each day. Albeit, you might do it with a little bit more adrenaline, a little bit more gusto, a little bit more vigor, whatever. The third approach is, okay, they're good words, they're nice words, they're nice concepts. How does it work? So now, over the last month, as we lead into the trials, I'll say, Ashton, you warm up. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You warm up. When you're ready, you tell me. Okay, now we're starting the competition. Ashton Eaton up, first throw. Hardy just threw 50 feet. Clay just threw 52. Eaton, next thrower. And so I put him through a scenario as the trials will be or a competition will be. And uh, you work it out there. In the pole hole, for example, uh, okay, Eaton up, first attempt, opening bar, 14 feet, 9 inches, or 15-1, or whatever. And let's go. Let's get over it. So we play that scenario, making sure the first long jump, the first shot, put throw or the first high jump, whatever, is a make so you get those bars underneath you and then you can not relax, but you can start working from that point on. So that's, uh, that's our approach. Uh, is it for a high score? Mm, you know, when you look at a high score, Paul can tell you, uh, you look at a high score after the javelin's over. You kind of look at the book and see where you're at and say, geez, I can, I can go 8,400, so if I run this or whatever. Uh, that's the way we do it. We never... Even when Ashton broke down, I think, three world records in this heptathlon, we never once talked world record. We never once talked about any of that stuff until uh, it came to the last event. I said, geez, you're in pretty good shape. Or you, if you were on this, you, you could break the world record. So uh, that's that's the way we approach it. Others might do it different and be as successful, but that works for us. L- let me ask Chris Randolph in studio. Chris, you taking a, a similar approach to this uh, as you as you go into the uh, the trials? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I... Th- and me and Tarek used to do that back when he was there. And uh, uh, Harry's right. You have to um, you have to practice uh, like you're going to compete in the competition, and you have to compete like you did in practice. And uh, and we would uh, get those scenarios going, similar to what he does with Ashton up there, where uh, you know me and Tarek uh, would be throwing discus, and uh, uh, we would bet uh, you know a muffin or something uh, on the next discus throw if you did better yourself. <laughs> that didn't help me. That didn't help me post no. you know post training. <laughs> I mean, yeah, put some muffins on there. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it, uh, in a way, it got your... Great memories with those muffins. I remember that. That was great. <laughs> right, right. And exactly. But in a way, that got your uh, your adrenaline going, uh, just a little bit more focus in what you were trying to do uh, at that practice. And that's what happens when you compete. You know, you're... Um, uh, you're trying to get that drive. So, well, I think that's uh, I think that's what separates great, you know, good and great is is the ability to, uh, you know, find that motivation, find that uh, direction when you start the event, uh, so, so that you're not going out on your first one and trying to have a PR in the long jump or a PR in the in the high jump or something. You're just going through the motions, doing things the way you know how to do them technically. Once you get over the bar and that pressure's gone, then you can start to open up the competition a little bit. But uh, it, it's it's you know that like I said that's what's going to separate good guys from great guys. Coach, before coach, before we go, uh, g- give us a quick uh, last minute. Give us a favorite Paul Tarek story for the listeners. Oh yeah, I, there's probably a million, but based, you know just on, on this conversation we were just having in in 2003. Yeah, 2003, just before the national championships, uh, Paul was struggling big time with his uh, long jump. Huge struggling. And his uh, discus was okay, but not great. So he goes up to Stanford, he takes, runs down the runway, he runs a good 100, runs down the runway, 24, was it two and a half, Paul? Yeah, it's on 27, 738, I can remember. Yeah, 24, Seven meters 30, 24, 38. Huge long jump. And, and what a big comfort that was. He only had to take one jump and he was done. And he wasn't even jumping near that practice. The other thing 
in that meet is then now he's having a good meet. He runs a decent hurdles. Discus, foul, foul, 150, wins the discus on his third attempt. That is clutch stuff that I think needs to be marketed, whether it's Paul Taylor, Chris Randolph, or, you know, whoever it is. That's clutch stuff. That's stuff that goes unseen about the sport of the decathlon. And these guys would be, to be patted on the back because of that. I, I, they do a great job. Clutch stuff indeed and stuff that needs to be put out there, and we're trying to do that here on Living the Run. Coach Harry, so uh, so thankful that you came. I miss you over at the Atascadero Kennedy Gym. I uh, miss seeing you there. But uh, shoot, if, if we can get you again, we'd love to have you on. Just give us an update after the trials and as we get closer to the Olympics. Uh, we'd, we'd love to talk to you again, so we hope we can, can get you back on the line. Thanks, guys, and uh, tell uh, Derek and Randolph that, uh, Chris, you got to stay healthy, so stay away from the moral rock surfing before the trials, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, no moral rock surfing for Randolph. Yeah, no. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Coach. See you guys. We'll be back, close out, living the run, tips and takeaways in just a minute. Back with Living the Run. Those of you just tuning in on this June 6th National Running Day. National Running Day. I did get a run in today. It was uh, it was treacherous. I had a uh, hundred meter. It, it, somebody told me that they thought this would be a good workout, and uh, I'm gonna and have you to believe. <laughs> and you believe them. <laughs> this was a uh, get this hundred meter dash followed by ten pull ups followed by hundred meter dash followed by ten burpees. How fast? How fast was a hundred no, meter dash? No rest. Thirty seconds rest after those four, and you do ten rounds of it. How, how uh, fast was a hundred meter dash? Well, how fast was my hundred meter dash? Well, well, I mean, what percentage of, of effort were you? I mean, were you, you, you were you all out sprinting? No. No, especially not at the beginning, but to eighty to ninety percent, eighty to ninety percent. So, so I'm sorry, I got to add this up again. Hundred meter dash, at almost we'll say ninety percent. Yep. Ten pull ups. Ten pull ups. Hundred meter dash back. Ten burpees. Ten burpees. Thirty second rest. Thirty second rest. Ten rounds. So really, you're going, you're going. You know, normally the one to one ratio is for aerobic, and then it's like a, I think it's like a two to five ratio or something like that for anaerobic. But uh, you, you went, so you were probably working out for what four minutes straight. Yeah, about and you took thirty seconds rest. Yeah, then you three, did about it again. three minutes, three minutes, and then thirty seconds rest. It got rough. Oh yeah, I, I can. Im- <laughs> when did the lactic acid kick in? About set three. <laughs> set three or four. Yeah, set three, set or, three four. or four. It's good. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're gonna be rocked. Yeah, man. I, I wanted to put that in for National Running Day though. It was a good one. Hey, before we go, I want to hear Chris Randolph at the break said he wanted to chip in with his favorite Paul Tarek story. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> he said none I of think, them were. Uh, What I said was that uh, I have probably maybe six or seven stories, but they just really aren't uh, radio appropriate. They're not family friendly. None of them appropriate. Go ahead. I was going to say, if you made it through that workout without throwing up, then you did better than Paul Tarek. So yeah, uh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, to be to be truthful, I've never I have not thrown up in a running in a, in a, have in you really? a running yeah. workout. I've come close. I've I've had the dry heaves a few times. Thank goodness I didn't eat before I went to maybe, practice. Maybe that's what I saw was the Paul dry Tarek, heaves. Still yeah. still enough daylight to try that workout. Still it's enough. Like, no, I'm not going to do it. No still way. enough daylight for all you living the run listeners to get a run in here. Let's get quickly tips and takeaways from today. Uh, I, I would say my tip and takeaway is from Harry how he talked about the decathlon and, and Randolph too. They talked about being able to do something whether it's good or bad. You you move on to the next event. You know, it, you can you can transfer that skill directly to life. Good things are going to happen and bad things are going to happen. Uh, you need to be able to move on. You know, plug through it. Uh, get on to the next thing and approach that. If you carry the uh, stresses and angers of, of one part of your day, you know, it could ruin the rest of your day. You need to learn to forget those things and move on. Rando, give us one. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Tarek on that, and also that uh, you know you're you're going to practice uh, like you're going to compete in the competition. I mean, for me, that's a big one: is is going out every day and making sure that I'm doing exactly what I want to do in the competition uh, that's coming up in a couple weeks at the trials. And so, it's a great outlook. And you, I mean, it's a you're going to win if you do it. Absolutely. I, the one I'll take away, and we said this the other day, is John Wooden said, "Make each day your masterpiece." And it almost kind of sounds like when you get out and you participate in any event, make it your best for that day, and, and just give it the best on that day, and and. and and know that uh, that's the best opportunity you had. And that's what you have to do coming up here in two weeks, going into this decathlon. Uh, you've got uh, 10 events. You know, you don't get two down by one event. You go forward. Those of you, let's let's look up Chris Randolph. He's a, an Olympic hopeful, local guy, fun guy, awesome, awesome stuff, awesome potential. 
Thank you, Chris, for joining us. Thank you to Harry Mara for joining us in studio next weekend, or next week on Living the Run. Sharon Day, Olympian in 2008. Live healthy, live bold, live the run.